If you've got your church Bible, page 1060 is when there are a few. Uh, oh, and if you are, thank you. Look at that. If anyone else wants one? No? Okay. Page 1060. We read from the New International Version. We're reading from Luke 23, verses 44 to 56. And it's entitled, The Death of Jesus. <clears throat> now, it was about noon, and darkness came over the whole land <coughs> until three in the afternoon. For the sun had stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. And the centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. And when all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. The burial of Jesus. Now there was a man named Joseph, a man of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God, and going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb, <coughs> cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph, and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared the spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. Lord, we know your word is powerful and effective, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even down to bone and marrow. Lord, we pray that your, your divine scalpel would work in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives today <clears throat> and that you would speak to us through this passage of scripture take my words make them yours we, i pray lord lord let nothing of me be seen and everything of you we ask this in your name amen so my message this afternoon is about people and about portents Portents is a very old-fashioned word. I had to look it up. But a portent generally is something that is a symbol or a sign of something good or something bad. But first of all, I want to look at the four groups of people that I see in this passage. The first person was the centurion. The centurion acknowledges that Jesus was a righteous man. And he praises God. And you know, we don't know anything more about the story. If we were in the Catholic tradition, we might be inclined to ascribe some saintly name to him and have some saints stay after him. But that's not us. We have to deal with the facts that we've got here and he's not mentioned again. He praises God and says he is a righteous man. You see, this centurion might have been changed by his confession, but we just don't know. And we might be changed by our confession. Yes, Jesus is a good man. Yes, Jesus is a great teacher. Yes, but in a world of so many other religions where Muhammad is good and Buddha is good and so and so somebody else is good, it's not enough to say that he is a good man. We need to step beyond that. 
we have to allow the confession of our faith to take hold in our heart and allow the Holy Spirit to change our hearts and our minds. Don't be like the centurion. Will we be like the people who had followed Jesus? You know, Jerusalem at this time was packed with people. And, you know, in my little meanderings this week, I thought, who could be there? Maybe, maybe Zacchaeus was there. He might have been there. You don't know. Maybe some of the ten lepers who were healed by Jesus, maybe they were there. Maybe Mary and Martha and Lazarus, maybe they were there. Our Bible doesn't tell us. Will we be like the people who watched and beat their breast? Again, beating, beating your breast is a very old-fashioned term. And I, I had to look this up as well. I'm not nearly bright, as bright as I, I like to think I am. You see, this means about being outraged, very angry, or upset about a situation. But the dictionary says, or pretending to be. You know, and I think there may have been people who had gone for the spectacle, this spectacle of three men being crucified. <coughs> and being emotional about it, and being caught up in the moment. But these people, again, did not take it past that. You know, ours is not a faith of being emotional about things. We've got to be focused on the truth. It's so easy to get emotional about the cross, and that's the right thing to do. But we need to allow that truth to take hold and change our direction. Not merely looking at it, but walking in a different way. Walking in Jesus' way. We need to walk toward that cross. And the change that it can bring in our lives. Will we be like the people who knew him, but were standing at a distance. You know, and my heart goes out to this group. I think they must have been petrified. They have seen their rabbi, their teacher, their messiah, taken by force, subjected to a kangaroo court, beaten, accused, and murdered. And possibly they were uncertain about the future. They had been paralysed by fear. But note that these are the same people, particularly the women, who followed Joseph, found out where he had taken Jesus' body, and prepared spices and perfumes. In spite of the perceived fear, they were still willing to identify with Jesus. We're heading in the right direction here. Or will we be like Joseph of Arimathea? A man who stepped up and out of the shadows, he went to Pilate, the governor, and risked much. He risked ostracization from his people. He risked financial ruin from his, the council that he would be on. He risked being kicked out of the temple. He touched a dead body on the eve of, Pas or on, on the eve of the Passover. That would make him unclean. He wouldn't be able to celebrate the Passover, which is the most important Jewish festival. Financially, he would um, <laughs> Born the cost of burying Jesus' body. And yet Joseph stepped, stuck, stepped out of the shadows, too many S's in that sentence, and into the light of Jesus' kingdom. 
Am I willing to do the right thing in spite of <coughs> Excuse me. In spite of the financial or the social cost, will we be like Joseph of Arimathea? This this um, this series has been called "Walking with Jesus," and actually, the truth is now we've come to a grinding halt. There we see Jesus on the cross outside of the city wall on what could probably be described as the tip outside of the, the, the city. And so we've looked at the people and now I'd like to talk about the portents. Now, this is going to be a tough crowd because some of you weren't even born or you were really small. Who remembers the 11th of August, 1999? Anybody? Yeah. Oh, Nobody? <laughs> yeah. Go. Uh, total eclipse of the sun. Total eclipse of the sun. Awesome. <laughs> Who else said yes? <laughs> you did. Do you, do you remember? I remember something happened. <laughs> you, you remember something happened. Good one, Bell. <laughs> Hugh, tell me what. Were, were you on the south coast then? Were you were living on the south You weren't living on the south coast. Oh dear. Okay, this is a, this is a tough crowd. Do you remember anything about that day? Okay, tell us. Tell us about it. Uh, we were in southern Germany. Okay. And um, the sky was perfectly clear. Yeah. So for some reason we got in the car and drove two and a half hours up to Ulm where we used to live. Yeah. And it was clouded over, so we didn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we saw it going dark. No, no. We so it. it went dark? Oh, yes, it went dark. Okay. okay. Anything else sensory about what happened that night, oh, that uh, uh, morning? The world stopped. The world stopped? Yeah, Amazing. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Well, it was the only topic of conversation at that time. Yeah. 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 Anybody else remember that specific date? Peter? I didn't notice that date, but I remember what happened. Okay, what, what was your experience? It was sort of brownie, golden. Yeah. Um, it wasn't totally dark. No. It was, it was very much yeah. that sort of colour. Yeah. How about <clears throat> sound? Remember don't remember temperature it was cold. It was cold. yeah I, I remember it going it really cold. really yeah, cold I remember birds being quiet. quiet yeah it was really eerie it was really eerie so my my my, my <coughs> memories to be honest it was a bit of a damp squib I felt it it, you know, it, it it didn't live up to the height I was working for a company who um, had a load of cash and carries on the on the Cornwall sort of peninsula, and they thought this was going to be like, chick -chick. but it wasn't. It was it was a bit, a bit cloudy. Bit. But living in Cardiff, we, we didn't get a total eclipse here, but it was it was a bit underwhelming. Not quite as dark as I expected. The temperature dropped. I felt quite significantly. It was a little eerie, but it did seem really peaceful. Verse 44 says, Now it was about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until about three in the afternoon. That sounds like one mother of all eclipses. A super eclipse, if you like. An eclipse of epic proportions. But I have some bad news. Eclipses couldn't, uh, an eclipse couldn't have happened then. For a, a, a solar eclipse to happen, it has to be a new moon. And for the Passover to happen, it has to be a full moon. So the, 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 the two things don't tally up. Bad news? No, it's great news. What it allows us to do is say to the people, ah, it was just a natural phenomenon, it was nothing big, it, was, it, it just occurred and, and, and we've, we've coincided those events. No, what it allows us to do is to believe in something outside of the natural world, into the supernatural world, into a God-provided world.
in a world that wants definitive answers, this was not a natural phenomenon. It opens up this account to be read in a completely different way, in a god fueled supernatural way. This world wants definite answers. It wants everything to be squared away, 90 degrees, exactly the same, right fit. It just wants things to fit into pigeonholes or to boxes. People will seek to downplay the death and resurrection of Jesus. Oh, it didn't happen. It's all made up. Islam even teaches that it was somebody else on the cross, that God, their God, not ours, made someone else to look like Jesus, and he was crucified instead of Jesus. A kind of exchange program. But, you know, that's exactly what God did, engineer at the cross, a divine exchange program. We exchange our sins and filth and unrighteousness for Jesus' perfection and his righteousness. Matthew's version of this same verse records things slightly differently. If you want to follow in the book, in the Bible, it's page 999. It says, uh, Matthew 27, verse 46, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachithiami, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The darkness and the agony are tangible here. At the cross, Jesus became sin and bore the Father's wrath. It was as if he was cast into the darkness for us. And in that moment, the intimacy, the relationship he had always had with the Father was swallowed up by righteous judgment that sin deserves. And he prays, my God, why have you forsaken me? As a way of expressing that horror of the experience of bearing all our sin. The father, not being able to bear looking at this, turns his back. Unable to watch the sight of Jesus taking on the sins, my sins and your sins. And the darkness rushes in. And you know, you might be sitting here today and you are facing a darkness like you have never known before. There are so many issues that we face, health issues, financial issues, family issues, or something else. And perhaps you feel that there is no light to be seen and you are sitting in an eclipse. You feel that the situation is eclipsing the sun, but the sun is spelt S-O-N. And like my experience of an eclipse, you might feel that you are spiritually cold and far from the S-O-N. Or that you are spiritually deaf, unable to hear the sun, or perhaps spiritually blind, unable to see the sun. And if you're here today and you feel that this is you, let me know at the end. I'd love to pray with you or get somebody to pray with you. But wait a minute, that eclipse is not the only portent that happened on that day. Let's look at verse 45. Verse 45 says, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And it's almost as if God the Father has turned his back. The, the darkness is rushing in, but the overwhelming love of God can bear it no more. But from the Holy of Holies, the curtain is torn in two. One of my favourite quotes is from Martin Luther King. And it says, darkness cannot drive out. Only the light can do that. And on the cross, 
as, the, as the, the darkness seems to be closing in around Jesus and around his, his disciples and followers, the light pushes it back. The curtain is torn in two. Matthew goes on to say in his account, and behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were rent. Matthew records that the curtain was torn from the top to the bottom. Now this curtain was not like those reasonably large curtains. This curtain was somewhere in the region of 60 foot top to bottom. <coughs> It's also been stated this, this curtain was something like four inches thick. The effort to have torn it in two would be outside of man's ability. The fact that it was torn top to bottom speaks to me of God's initiative and not man's effort. The curtain <coughs> separated God and man. It separated the holy of holies from mankind. This is a kind of picture to me of how God and man were separated by sin. Once a year and only once a year, the high priest could go into the holy of holies by passing through the veil and entering God's <coughs> presence to make atonement for the sins of the people. And it's like, it is exactly like Jesus has stepped into that role of high priest and has bridged the gap between God and man. He is now our more perfect high priest. It also signifies to me that it was open to all people. It wasn't just for the Jews, it was now for the Gentiles too, for all people, for all time. You see, when that temple veil was torn, God moved out of that building and moved into a whole different <coughs> realm of experience for us and he would no longer dwell in a temple made by human, uh, by human hands. And you know, you might be sitting here thinking that you feel separated by some sort of curtain, by some sort of barrier that you've erected between God and yourself. <clears throat> Hebrews 4, 14, 16 says, Jesus Christ, through his death, has removed the barriers between God and man. And now we may approach him with confidence <coughs> with boldness. But regardless, you may feel that you are separated and that you would like to know this intimacy and this freedom with God. The good news is that 2,000 years later, the veil is still torn in two. <coughs> the access to the access to God is still there, straight to the throne room of God. And you know, you may feel distant, but all it takes today is one step, because for every step that you take towards God, God will take the rest towards you. He longs to be reunited with you and to show you his love. And again, if this is you, you know there's something wrong. It feels like there's a barrier between you and God, and you want to do something about that. Come and see me at the end. And so, we have come to 
what would tradi traditionally be an Easter, Easter Sunday story, or an Easter Sunday account. But let's be the right type of people going into Easter. Let's continue to walk with Jesus, even though the story feels like it's stalled a little bit. We're not walking, we're watching. Let's be like Joseph of Arimathea. Let's do the right thing in spite of social or financial cost. <coughs> yeah, let's, let's not be paralyzed by fear. Let's make sure that we are not having our hearing, our sight, and our relationship being <coughs> eclipsed by the sun or anything else out of the sin, if you like. Let's make sure that we take full advantage of getting into the presence of God, taking full advantage of that torn curtain <coughs> and making Jesus our more perfect high priest. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you cared so much for us that you were willing to take the sin of the world upon your body, that you were willing to die for us in that exchange, our filthiness for your righteousness. <coughs> Lord, we pray that, that you would continue to, to help us become more and more like you, Acknowledging that we'll never be perfect until we're, we're, we're in heaven with you. But Lord, we pray that you would, you would help us in thought and word and deed. Lord, we ask that you would remind us frequently that you are our great high priest. That the, sin, that the, the, the sacrifice of animals is no longer required because you have done it all. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you cared enough to die for us. And Lord, we, we just pray that you would help us be more like you and help others to meet you, to encounter you, and to come to you. Lord, we ask this in your precious name. We're going to move to our communion and I'm going to ask Catherine just to, to gently play something whilst we, we just reflect on the words in Corinthians 12. <clears throat> 